The other day, a friend at church mentioned that she's been diagnosed with a form of cancer, and her prognosis is pretty good, but it made me wonder, if I knew that I was facing cancer and that my days could end soon, what words of insight would I offer to my children? Well, our guest on today's Focus on the Family is facing that very thing, and she shares from her heart what she wants her children to know. This world is going to be tough, but that nearness to Jesus will be the grace that gets you through your heart, and that I desperately want to be here to see it, but I am trusting all of your days to Jesus, even if I don't get to, but I know your story is going to be great. Kara Tippetts joins us today, and you'll hear more of her heartbreaking yet inspiring story on today's Focus on the Family, hosted by Focus president and author Jim Daly. Uh, John, despite the soberness of today's topic, um, I think everyone uh, will be challenged by how you're living and uh, the story that God has given you. Uh, you know, I shared a bit of this story. I was the child when my mom died of cancer when I was nine years old. Mm. Um, these words are invaluable. And what Kara shared there, I wish um, I would have had more time with my mom to mm. hear that. Um, but it doesn't matter if it's cancer. Sure, that puts a, a finer point. All of us, our days are numbered yeah. for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to have that last breath. And uh, life is going to throw us curveballs. It's going to throw us big obstacles. It might be unemployment or challenges in your marriage. Um, these things are the difficulties in life that we need to seek the Lord and understand a way forward. Uh, this will be a very uh, emotional show as we talk about cancer, but it's important that we recognize that in the midst of our suffering, God is with us. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we're reminded of that in Psalm 112, uh, where the psalmist wrote, the righteous will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts will be steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And uh, being a Christian does not mean that you will have a pain-free life, that it will be nothing but comfortable. Uh, or even that you'll live a long life. God does not promise us happy or easy, uh, but he does promise us an eternal glory if we've accepted Jesus Christ into our lives. And, um, and we know that in the midst of our suffering, yes, he is there. Mm, well, he is, Jim, and that's a great assurance. And our guests will talk powerfully about how they've experienced that today. Uh, Jason and Kara Tippetts live in Colorado Springs, and they're the parents of four young children. Kara is chronicling her story of battling cancer in a blog called Mundane Faithfulness, and also in her book, The Hardest Peace. And uh, because of the severity of her diagnosis, her condition changes regularly, and you can get the latest updates on her treatments, her insights, and and such uh, at her blog, and we'll link over there from focusonthefamily.com slash radio. Uh, John, to kind of set up and give the backdrop to the story, the Tippets moved here to Colorado Springs a few years ago to plant a church. And uh, right after moving here, uh, Kara experienced a terrible fall in her laundry room. And uh, then they were forced to evacuate their new home as um, the Waldo Canyon fire swept through our city, uh, which burnt down 346 homes. Mm -hmm. uh, their home was not destroyed, but they had smoke damage. And you'll hear Kara reference that in her story. Yeah, this is one resilient couple. And let's go ahead and hear their story on today's Focus on the Family. Tell us. You know, as a Christian, as a believer, when you hear that, all this is going wrong. I mean, you've, I'm sure had black eyes and yep. bloody nose yep. from the fall and then having to try to get everything out of your house in case that burned down. And yep. then you go to the doctor and find out you have cancer. Yes. Um, tell us about that. Well, the fall, when I fell, that was in January. So now we're in summer when the fire came. And... Uh, I was cleaning walls and dealing with smoke damage, and I was about to get ready to go on a date with Jason. He was up in Denver. And when I found it, I almost immediately knew it was cancer. Mm -hmm. I almost immediately knew. I just wept. And my daughter saw me crying, 
And I didn't want to startle her because I was not sure. And she was following me all around the house. How old is she? She's 12, okay. but she's very intuitive. And tears, she's like, well, mom, what's dripping off your nose? I'm, I said, I'm fine, I'm fine, but I could not stop the tears. So I asked the babysitter to come early and I just ran away and had a girlfriend meet me because he was running late. The moment for me was a few days later, I just started hiking in Ute Valley over by our house. I just started hiking and hiking and hiking and Jason would give me time with the Lord. And I remember one day walking toward, and I was looking at the burn and you could see places or ridges where the fire hadn't hit and there was growth. And there was something both ugly and beautiful about it. And I looked at that and thought, that's my story. It is both ugly, but God, you're gonna do something beautiful. And I'm the personality that I like to go to the end of the story. I don't like to panic. I like to go to the end of the story. And on that hike, I just prayed, Lord, if you are a covenantal God and you love not only me, but you love my children, then if you take me, then this is for, for my good and for the good of the story of my husband and my kids. Mm. And I just had to wrestle through that. And I still wrestle through it every mm. day of, cause I think a lot of myself and think I'm the best answer for my kids. And that's my pride. I don't know. I don't know how many days I have. I don't know the number of hair on my head. And I did last year when I was bald, but, um, <laughs> but I know his plan is good and suffering isn't the absence of his goodness. Kara, let's talk about this because it's so important. Um, tell us what the diagnosis is right now. What did the doctor tell you so we can understand it better? When I was first diagnosed, I was diagnosed with um, stage two breast cancer. And stage two meant it was in my breast and it was also in my lymph nodes. Um, at the time, they could only feel one lymph node. So then I went through a series of chemo, then mastectomy, then radiation. And in the mastectomy, they were, they were hoping that the chemo had taken all the cancer. Visibly, they, all the lumps were going away. But when they did the mastectomy, there was still cancer present. Mm. And that's why I had to do so much radiation. I did 40 treatments of radiation mm. in my, on my upper quarter. My cancer in particular is hormone driven. So this fall, Jason and I decided to be proactive and get a consult about getting my ovaries taken out just as a precautionary measure. And as he did a, an exam, he found tumors. And so my cancer, my breast cancer had taken over my whole reproductive system. So one of my ovaries was the size of a tennis ball mm -hmm. and it was cancerous. And so now after that surgery, my new uh, diagnosis is stage four metastatic cancer, which metastatic cancer means that your cancer has moved from one place to another and that it moves so quickly, it is an indication that it's in my blood. And so now I am on medicine to suppress my hormones and Basically, my oncologist says, we just wait to see where it shows up next, and then we bite it from there. Mm. I think it's important to know that and to understand that as we carry through the discussion, obviously. So you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. No. And I forgot. I also started having headaches, so they did an MRI, and they found breast cancer in my brain as well, which is kind of significant. Mm. So I did uh, radiation mm. on my brain with a cyber knife, a very focused radiation knife to deal with that small how i mean with Goodness. all of this going on in your life i mean how do you begin to process this how do you as a believer in god i mean so many people when very insignificant things happen panic um, how are you processing this how uh, is jason helping you as your husband you have four children four to twelve is that right yes i mean tell us what's going on in your heart you know, the other morning I got up with my daughter and we were reading through Proverbs. And I don't know the exact reference, but it basically says, those who listen to the Lord, God will grant you a freedom from the dread of disaster. Mm -hmm. 
And I can find that specific verse later, but what stuck out to me, and I said to my daughter, I said, do you see this, Ella? Do you see it? It's not that he spares us the disaster. He spares us the dread of the disaster if we listen to Mm. God. And it was this beautiful moment, and I could look at my daughter and say, Ella, I cannot promise you that I am not going to die. I cannot promise you that cancer is not going to return to my body. But I can look at this and say, if we live near to God and we know that the nearness of him is our good and our only good, then he will spare us the dread of disaster. And honestly, Jim, the debilitating part of this is the dread. And when I start dreading, I realize I'm not listening to God. It's that litmus test to say, you're not in the word, you're not listening, or you're believing lies. Mm. And the lies come and they they overwhelm us both at the different times. My writing from Mundane Faithfulness, I, it became a journey of naming God's small graces in my day. Mm. You know, the, I've known the big G grace that Jesus died for me and has set me free to be truly free. But the small graces that showed up every day in meals, in kindness, in friends sitting by my bed, and women flying from all over the country to take care of us, I started to write to be reminded and to name those graces. Mm. I, I admire your courage. I mean, I know where you're at. It's got to be at times, um, it's got to be frightening. Because in some ways, you don't know what the outcome will be. Although, what's hanging over your head is death. Yes. Uh, Jason, the husband. I mean, we want to step in and fix it. You can't fix this, can you? Right. Yeah. You know, I think walking through this for the past uh, year and a half, uh, that's one of the big lessons I've learned is I can't fix it. So how do I live in faithfulness? How do we live in support of Kara, love for my kids? You know, I think there's also another another part that changes your view, knowing that your wife has cancer that's metastasized and proven it's moved around her body. That, it, you know, there's also an intensity in your life that you think we need to make the most of this minute, which yeah. really can just wear you out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we've gone through that phase, and I know that phase will come again. We've gone through that phase of we started to do everything we can because Kara's up and around today, um, and then it's spending time with our kids and answering their questions, and oh. and really just there's a lot of times they just cry, and even driving to pick my kids up, many days I had to stop and park and stop crying, so I could get my kids and feel like there was some normal in their life. Yeah. And, um, but I cried with my kids many times. Yeah. Let me ask you this, <clears throat> Kara, the, uh, you know, my mom died of cancer when I was nine mm-hmm. and, um, you know, she accepted the Lord the day before she died, which I understood much later in my life, what that meant. I didn't yes. know it at the time. In that context, and it could be generational, um, you know, it was, let's not tell the kids anything. Mm. And so literally I came into a room, that's even hard to talk about, where my brother, Mike, who was 19, said, uh, I've got bad news, mom's dead. Mm. That's how I learned of it. Mm. And uh, what would you say to those parents? What are you living for your kids right now? for your little ones who are going to potentially hear those words, what do you say to them? We have such an age range that some understand more than others, kind of like your brother at 19 and you at five. Um, We have a 12 year old who knows that cancer is deadly. And I have a four year old who knows that her mommy was bald last year. And, And my son, he prays against chemo. He doesn't realize that Mm -hmm. the prayer is really against cancer. And, you know, I've gotten lots of letters from people like you, Jim, who are thankful for the open conversation we're having with our kids at the appropriate ages that they can handle it. And it's hard. We feel like pilgrims walking in a land that we don't know where we're going. 
and the path is very dimly lit right in front of us. Mm. And I feel like my four-year-old will draw pictures, and in her pictures of me are my scars that she's seen me get. Scars on my tummy, scars on my breasts, and that's what she understands. And so I'll talk to her about them. But I'm her beautiful mother that she loves very much. And she knows these scars mean something very big, but her age doesn't lend it to understanding. Mm. And so Jason and I understand for the little ones, as age comes, the conversation will mature. Practically speaking, uh, what have you said or what would you say to your children at their different ages, four to 12, mm. which is perfect? What, what do you say to the 12 year old daughter? And what do you say to your four-year-old? How, how would you go about doing that? Mm -hmm. Initially, when we got the diagnosis, uh, we went to our pastor and prayed and spent a lot of time quiet before we just, we came home. And we decided to be very frank with the older two, our nine-year-old and our now 12-year-old. And, um, let their questions lead us. And with the two little ones, I remember coming home and putting them in the bath and they had been playing all morning and I put them in the bath and, and I said, Lake story, your mommy is going to be bald. I'm going to lose all my hair in about three weeks. It's going to be all gone. And they giggled, they giggled hysterically. Oh, mommy, you are going to look like a man. Yeah. And we just laughed. And I said, you know, we, it's going to be hard and mommy's going to be sick, but I'm always your mommy and you can always come and be next to me. And so I think for them, they are fiercely attached to me. My son is very protective of me yeah. and my daughter is just attached. So. Um, in their unknowing, they needed to be very close to me. And so the people who cared for us, we were very careful to have people who understood to not, sh you know, not shame our kids, to let them come near to both of us, even if I was very tired. Yeah. And for the older two, we told them I had cancer mm -hmm. and the process, and, and we let their questions lead them. And the questions came over months yeah. and they mm -hmm. still slowly come. Right. It's those moments where you have to spend a quantity of time to get the few quality mm -hmm. questions. Our very oldest is one who is very private and keeps her feelings in and is kind of a pressure cooker. And so we have to be very sensitive to her. Um, and Jason and I are question askers. So we are constantly asking them questions of their heart. How is your heart today? How are you feeling lonely? How are you feeling loved? What are your worries over mommy today? So there was an intentionality in question asking. Uh, and um, we had to show up for that because that part of it was hard because we were tired. Yeah. This cancer took us to an exhaustion that we have never known in our lives. Mm -hmm. And we're still there. Oh, I can imagine and the kids. I mean, it's beautiful because to answer those questions forthrightly, honestly. It's, uh, again, I just believe that's so important. It is, mm -hmm. it is. And it's a hard conversation to have, and it's a long conversation. Was there a question that kind of caught you off guard, or was it all something that you anticipated pretty well? One day, my oldest daughter was struggling in a relationship, and I was hurting for her over just a typical junior high relationship. And I just turned to her and I said, how much time of your day do you spend worrying mm -hmm. that your mom's going to die? And she broke down and oh. she said, I, all day long, mom, yeah. all day mm -hmm. long. And I just wept with her and we just cried together and said, I said, I don't know. I cannot give you the answer for why this is happening. I can't answer it, but I know that we are in God's love. We are not on the outside mm -hmm. fighting for my health to get back into it. And I just cried with her and said, it's a, it's a huge bummer that your mom has cancer. You're in middle school and you want to be cool and you have a bald mom. I'm sorry. And you know, in the beginning, 
I would ask her, what do you want me to wear on my head? Because I'm going to see your friends today. Mm-hmm. And I let her I let her navigate that. Mom, yeah. will you wear your wig? Which I hated. <laughs> but she was a middle schooler and, and yeah. wanted to fit in. <clears throat> And then one point, Ella said, Mom, I can tell you're more comfortable bald. You don't have to wear your wigs anymore for me. And I never wore it again. Wow. Mm-hmm. But I let her dictate that yeah. for me because I remember being in middle school and you want to be the same as everybody, not different. Right. So I tried to be sensitive. No, I mean, that's a beautiful way to engage your children yeah. in the process yeah. of what's happening. I think there was another thing that was helpful was we had families sort of adopt each kid uh, within our church who already they had good relationships with and they could be another either a person or a family that could just mentor them through this yeah so um each of our kids knew if you want to talk about mom you are free i mean they can talk to anyone about it but specifically these people would love to talk to you about it so you trusted them obviously yeah we trusted them so you know, yeah. one uh, girl would come pick up Ella and they'd go out for lunch and just talk. So yeah. it, it wasn't just that as our kids, you could only talk to us about it. Yeah, It was here some people, they're in our church, they love our family, they love you, and they're going to spend special time with you. Yeah, And I think that was helpful it really was. for them to have another place to talk. It was helpful for us too knowing there were other conversations they were having. Yeah, it's beautiful the way you describe it because again, it's almost like a a chaotic scene and nobody knows how to react emotionally. Yeah, You don't, Mm -hmm. uh, your spouse doesn't, Mm -hmm. the kids don't, your friends don't. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of think through how to lay the groundwork so everybody can participate. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it it takes intentionality. It will not happen Mm -hmm. without thinking about it, praying about it. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, obviously the Lord's showing up and all that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's beautiful the way that you've done it. Mm. You know, we realize we have such a, I'm a stay at home mom and and that role in our house is so important. You know, you're the Ah. glue that holds Mm -hmm. everything together. And, (laughs) And so we recognized when I was out of commission through chemo, that we needed a mom. And so with each, I had six treatment and with each treatment, we would have a mom fly in and they would stay over a week to take care of our family and be the mom, pack the lunches, love the kids, love me so that Jason one could do his job, but also it brought a steadiness to our home that there was real care. And then my burden was light. My job was to get better. My job was to sit by the fire and snuggle the kids. And these women came in and managed the home. So we just see such a high value in mom that when Mm -hmm. mom was out of commission, we had to call in the moms and we did. And they came and they came. Beautiful. It was beautiful. Good plan and good thing for churches to do. Mm -hmm. You know, the body of believers coming around a you know, a family that's struggling Absolutely. in that way. That's we were, we were loved so well. Uh, mm-hmm. I wish everyone could walk through cancer like we did mm-hmm. with, you know, a community desperate to bring food or clean the house or uh, people longing to help us. Yeah. And it was humbling. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we learned it is, it is much harder to receive than give. And we learned the hard one art of receiving help when here we live like we had it all together you know we had we had to embrace our neediness and say yep we need your help and we still have that's a fight for us Mm -hmm. to embrace and say we need help Mm. and when i found out my last pet scan and mri it was our first time to get positive results Mm. every test we'd ever had came back more cancer more cancer and this last december my brain tumor was smaller and there was no new cancer and we went to school and picked up our oldest daughter and I was screaming and yelling and she I just saw this weight lift from her and and we took that time because she does understand Um, she has a young boy in her class who lost his mom to cancer and so she knows that this is a very hard story so how do you manage that pressure though as you were saying jason that this could be our last christmas this could be our last anniversary yeah this could be our last time with the kids how do you talk as a couple when your head's hit the pillow at night 
Well, it brings an intentionality to to life, and it brings everybody mm-hmm. to town. It brings all your family pilgriming from all over. Cancer, you know, everybody, mm-hmm. and you could look at everybody and realize they are counting my days. They are wondering if this is my last Thanksgiving. And you think little things like, don't let my turkey burn. This might be my last turkey. I want, it, I want them to remember a good turkey. I mean, it's silly. The, the intensity in every thought can be a little exhausting. But then there's something beautiful. It's this beautiful noticing of everything. Mm. I noticed that my oldest still holds my hand. I noticed things about my children that I, I think without cancer, I lived gluttonous of life, that I had this endless horizon of days. And cancer has been this gift of noticing, appreciating, valuing, and speaking words of love all day long to my kids. Mm. And then like last week, I blew it and the kids weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And I yelled and I'm not a yeller. And they said, you're hurting our hearts. And I was like, oh, and it just brought me to repentance so fast of this isn't who I want to be. Lord, change my heart. I need you. And then you get these desperate thoughts of I'm going to die and they're going to remember my grumpy morning. And you just kind of have to, you know, know those moments make me realize how much I need Jesus. Uh. Cancer makes me realize how much I need Jesus. And the goal isn't that my kids think well of me. The goal is that my kids see Jesus in my life. Wow. And Kara, the, uh, yeah, that is beautiful. I mean, in terms of the struggle and being real with your kids. And I applaud you. Again, I was nine when that happened yeah. to me. And, uh, you know, I think it's wise to open that discussion up with your children. It's yeah. far better than just getting the cold news that your mom is gone or your dad is gone. Mm-hmm. That was traumatic. Yes. And it's all traumatic. But let me ask you this. Um, when you think of God, and you've said it so beautifully to this point, you obviously you strike me as a person who is maturing Christ. We all are dying of something. Absolutely. That's the irony. Yes. We all are going to have our last breath. But it brings an acuteness when you had a, you're in your mid-30s. I mean, you're feeling something that, and going through something that, you know, should happen in your 70s, 80s, or 90s. But it does bring this finiteness to our life. It does bring a crystal clearness to every hour being precious, doesn't it? It does. It does. And for you, too, as a couple, Jason, um, does that spill over into you as the husband? Do you look at each day as an extra special gift from God? Um. Yes, but then being very honest, sometimes no. You know, sometimes I see my days as I dread this day because it's another day that's passing um, mm. and you can't freeze the present. So it is a hard, um, I think it's a balance. It's a tension that we kind of have talked a lot about uh, wanting to see our kids grow up you know, we all want to see our kids grow. We want, in one way, we want that to happen really fast mm. because we want them to have great memories of their mom and fun. And they want them to see and know uh, Kara. But on the other side of it is, no, you fight that. You want your kids to grow up slowly. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, a lot of days, it just, it's confusing. Mm. And uh, I think some people watch people in suffering and think they have it figured out or their life must look this some way at home where they just weep all the time. But our life is fairly normal. Uh, The only thing that's not normal is Kara has cancer. And that's in the back of our minds um, most of the time. I know it's in our kids' minds and we see how it affects them. And, uh, we still have to pack lunches and deal with fights uh-huh. and carpool mm-hmm. and, you know, you have a dailiness that you have to show mm-hmm. up for. And there are days that we show up for it. And then there's days, especially when we're waiting for test results, mm-hmm. where we say a normal person wakes up and then makes coffee. Okay, that's what I'll do. Mm-hmm. And then they drive to, and you have to tell yourself how to do your day because you're paralyzed in wow. fear mm-hmm. and um, 
you know, I think through the year, most of our prayers were help. God help us. Kara, mm -hmm. the obvious point too, when we talk about God in this, mm -hmm. um, you know, some people may question the healing aspect of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you are living it, uh, so often we pray for the Lord to heal us. We seek the Lord to help us out of our tough spot. Um, I'm sure you sure. and Jason have prayed mm -hmm. these prayers. Sure. Mm -hmm. What is that like to feel like he's not answering you the way you would hope he would? I don't think I feel that way. I think I feel like if I look at how my salvation was made on a cross, on a really ugly cross, who am I? Mm. Who am I to question the path he has for me. But I can expect him to show up in the heart, and he does. And that has grown my faith and my trust. So I feel like there's, you know, there are moments I would love not to be suffering. And I think especially for my kids, I wish my kids' story wasn't going to be hard. All of us want to protect our kids. And yet I see how the suffering and hard is what drew me to Jesus in the first place. And as a parent, I want my children drawn to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And if this hard story does it, then praise God. When you look at it, um, I've heard it said this way, you know, you look at life and life can be tough. There's mm -hmm. very few people that have an easy life. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even with all the materialism, mm -hmm. there are other emotional things that will occur. And uh, someone once said to me, it's as if the Lord has rigged it, that life mm -hmm. throws you these tough things so that we fall more into his arms, Absolutely. that we learn our need for him, our need to depend upon him, whether it's cancer or divorce or drug addiction or any of those things that will take us down. As John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, mm -hmm. and destroy. Mm -hmm. That is this life. Mm -hmm. uh, the enemy of our soul has that capability. And at some point we die. Now we confront it and we, as believers in Jesus, stand believing. But there's something there that God loves. I, I think it might be his perspective on life and death is quite different from our own. Mm -hmm. He knows what is after this. We don't. Yes. I mean, absolutely. we have a hope, absolutely. but we don't have a concrete knowledge of it. He does. Mm -hmm. And so as we, in especially um, Christians in more Western cultures, uh, we want to win. Mm -hmm. We want to be the winner. Yep. <clears throat> and we can't translate suffering very well mm -hmm. when our culture awards the winner, the prize. Because when you sit there riddled with cancer, not knowing what tomorrow will be, uh, the culture can say, oh, she's losing. Yes. How do you process that? Well, I feel through my writing, I'm not trying to have the corner on the hardest story. And I invite people to join. Jason is grateful for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, I try not to one-up anybody with my story. I invite everybody to come and read my story and share their heart. A mom that has a toddler that won't sleep is hard. And it's hard for kindness to show up on those days when you have a teething baby. So I'm not... In my writing, I'm not trying to have the hardest story. I'm trying to be transparent and not win, as the culture tells us to win. Mm -hmm. So other women who behind closed doors who aren't winning either can be honest. And this culture lends itself, especially moms, have it all together. And I invite women to be a hot mess because I'm a hot mess. And Jesus loves me. He recklessly loves me. And so I feel like that's why people show up. Some show up because they want to they want to appreciate, wait, that could be me. That story could be me. Help me. I haven't been appreciating doing laundry and doing bath time. I could be a mom that goes home tomorrow. Let me embrace this mundane life that I'm living. Because like Kara, my story could absolutely change. And then there are those who are suffering some very desperately hard stories like my own who need to be reminded to look for grace. 
I mean, sometimes if you're reminded of your own story, you forget to look. Mm. Um, writing this book, I, I remember last year very hard, but I have to go back through my writing and remember that there was joy and there was huge laughter and that we knew love. But when you collectively remember a hard moment, it's hard to remember that. Uh, in fact, that's coming out in your church. Um, yes. We talked a bit about that earlier, where uh, your church experience, you have successfully planted that church here in Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, talk about how this has been a big part of the story of your church, along with others with cancer in your little body. Yeah. You know, I think one, when you come to plant a church or you're pastoring a church, you want to be uh, successful, you want to come with these are the good ideas and you pray and and you work in all these things to make it uh, successful or um, take hold. What happened is our, in our case was as much as I might have had this fancy plan or secret sauce, really it was me just being honest with here's what's going on in our home. And I think what it did was it showed me how as people, especially as Christians, we say Christianity is so complicated. I just, I can't. But I think the real issue is it's not complicated. It's just really hard. But we make an excuse and make it complicated. Instead of, you look in the Bible, it's a very simple calling. In Mark 1, Jesus comes, his first message is repent and believe. And so what's our path every day? Repent and believe. So every Sunday in our church, really the message is repent and believe mm. and rest in Christ. And think of things in your life where you're not resting in Christ. And I think with our health, you know, with Kara being diagnosed with cancer, um, it's not something I can control and hold on to. So I have to just believe and I believe what the Bible says that God is good and he is our refuge and he is our strength. Regardless of your circumstances. Regardless. And it's interesting. You think about God being our refuge and our strength and our shepherd. Well, you would only need those if you were a needy person. Well, I'm a needy person. Mm -hmm. We're all needy people, but that really fights against how we want to see ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot in our culture. We want to be seen as accomplished and competent and successful, really that's the opposite understanding of the place we're supposed to be in. And in fact, you said the church mm. seems to be being built on suffering. Mm. That doesn't sound like a great mega church growth strategy, <laughs> <laughs> but it's agree. real. Yeah. yeah. One thing that someone brought up once, you know, in college or you take classes, you take a, a class and then you have a lab after it. And someone described that our church is not the classroom where you learn uh, about suffering. We're really in the lab where you look around and there is suffering, where my wife is there and she's bald, and has no hair, and she can't stand up. And there are other people in our church that suffer with leukemia and cancer and um, lots of other issues that God has brought them through, or God is taking them through that in the midst of it. And I think it would be wrong for us to just ignore those things. So what we try to do as a church is just see that uh, we're all suffering with something. Mm. And in that regard too, I want to reiterate for those that are just joining perhaps the, uh, the fact that you pray and you petition the Lord Absolutely. for his redemption in our bodies. Mm -hmm. It's yep. not to say you don't pray in that way. Right. Some people might hear that you're almost, uh, you know, you're comfortable in your suffering. Mm. That's not what you're saying, no. is it? Mm -mm. No, not at all. Mm -mm. You know, I see the verse, seek first his kingdom. And then, because I, I asked my mentor, is it wrong to pray for more days? Is it wrong for me to petition the Lord to see my children graduate? Is it wrong to specifically ask of him these things? And she answered me, seek first his kingdom, Kira. And then ask, see, in all of this, I'm seeking to glorify God in all that I do. Mm. And my heart is to be here.
And I think part of it is because we have a weak imagination for heaven. I think mm -hmm. if I really knew what heaven was, I'd say, take me tomorrow. But I look at mm -hmm. my little faces and I want to be the one that gets to shepherd them. I want to be the one to tell them about the glory of God and explain dating and how to shave your legs. And I mean, I, the big things and the little things I want to be here for. And, and yet, first I seek his kingdom and then we'll see what he, what he does, you know? Well, that is a powerful way to end this portion of the conversation with our guests, Kara and Jason Tippetts. And uh, Jim, they're so faithfully walking this journey. It's a journey that none of us would like to face. Well, John, it feels like they have a good grasp on um, the scripture and particularly James 1, 2 through 4, which says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Mm -hmm. uh, the truth of that scripture does seem to be something that every one of us needs to be reminded of. And it can inspire us as Kara and Jason have today to uh, follow God even in the darkness, even in the tough times of life. Well, you'll find more inspiration in Kara's book, The Hardest Peace, Expecting God's Grace in the Midst of Life's Hard. And I'll encourage you to look for that at a bookstore or online retailer. Our program was provided by Focus on the Family. And on behalf of Jim Daly and the entire team, thanks for listening. I'm John Fuller, inviting you back next time when we'll have more encouragement to help you and your family thrive in Christ. And when I found it, I almost immediately knew it was cancer. Mm -hmm. I almost immediately knew, I just wept. And my daughter saw me crying and I didn't want to startle her because I was not sure. And she was following me all around the house. How old is she? She's 12, okay. but she's very intuitive. And tears, she's like, well, mom, what's dripping off your nose? I'm, I was like, I'm fine, I'm fine. But I could not stop the tears. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine the tension and the uh, struggle of that moment, finding out that you have cancer and uh, sharing uh, that news with your children. Uh, very, very difficult. This is Focus on the Family with Focus President and author Jim Daly. I'm John Fuller, and last time we started a very powerful conversation with one couple. They're living faithfully in the midst of a heartbreaking breast cancer diagnosis. Uh, Kara was only in her mid-30s, John, when she discovered she had cancer. And it quickly overtook her whole body, including her brain. Um, she's gone through countless treatments, but she still lives with cancer in her body every day to this day. And uh, currently uh, does not have a timeline for how long she will live and be with her husband, Jason, and their four young children. Um, I'll tell you what, my heart breaks over that. Mm -hmm. uh, being that kid of a mom who died of cancer, I experienced it firsthand. I know the emotions and uh, my heart breaks for this family. Yet they have a story to share with us and hopefully it will grab our hearts. And one, to remind us to pray for them, but also to look and reflect on our own lives, mm. to know that each of us, no matter what our diagnosis may be in the future, we only have so many days to live. Nobody escapes this life. Nobody's immortal. And something will come across your path that's gonna rock your boat. Uh, maybe right now you're walking a path you don't wanna be walking. Maybe it's a health crisis like our guest, Kara, or maybe it's unemployment or trying to parent a wayward child or a marriage that's crumbling. We're here for you. We have caring Christian counselors on staff to take your call and help you walk through this situation. Yeah, and, and Jim, we should note here that uh, in recent days, we've had uh, just a flood of calls from mm. hurting families and individuals. We have, John, and so the way it'll work, you'll call the ministry here and uh, you'll leave your name and number and one of our counselors will call you back to speak with you yeah. and be patient 
because there are so many. I think right now we have over 300 people in that queue who need help. So thank you to those of you who support us and provide the counseling service. Um, that is such a kind gesture on your part. And for those who haven't supported Focus recently, I hope you will. This is the kind of help right at the front lines mm -hmm. that we need to be doing together. Now our guests once again are Kara and Jason Tippetts. And uh, Kara has chronicled her story in the book, The Hardest Peace, and also on her blog, Mundane Faithfulness. Let's go ahead and hear now that second part of the conversation with our guests on today's Focus on the Family. Have you thought about, I mean, in that way, because again, uh, you don't know what the next few weeks or few months might be like for you. And again, for those joining us, I mean, your body has been riddled with cancer. It seems to be in check, but the doctors are telling you it, it's still stage four and yes. there, there mm -hmm. may not be many tomorrows. Is exactly. that fair? That is fair. So the, have you thought through um, how to communicate those things to your kids about videotaping um, how to shave your legs. Yes, how yes. How to communicate with them. Because I can only say for mm. me, I mean, I can't remember my mom's voice. Yeah. Because I had no recording of her. Yes. Very few pictures of her. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You know, I think as a mom, after having four kids and a soft belly and <laughs> not looking like I wanted to look like, because um, our culture, you know, does that to us. I think I have put myself in front of the camera a lot more now. Jason, pick, you know, I was the camera taker probably, so I would not right. be in the pictures. And now Jason picks up the camera and our yeah. camera is tired because <laughs> we take so many pictures and um, the school bought us a video camera and we just wept because we knew why. And so people have asked me to make those videos for my kids and I struggle because that just seems final. Mm. And um, I think when they tell me that there's no other options, I will start doing that. But on my blog, I'm starting um, to write uh, letters for my kids in the future. And I might be there and I might not. Yeah. And, you know, I'm going to write letters to my graduate. And my, I feel like my blog is my heart. That my kids, when they want to hear my voice, will hear it. I'm a writer. And so they will be able to read these words that will forever be present. Mm. And I share my heart very openly on that in that space. The videos will come, yeah. but I'm not ready yet. Mm. Mm. I don't think you are either. No. no. Jim, there's an aspect uh, to what we're hearing from Jason and Kara that has kind of caught me. I, I expected them, knowing their story a little bit before we came into the studio, to be a little neat, neater and tidier. <laughs> uh, you've been very transparent. I mean, uh, you, your comment about, I mean, honest, yeah. uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to be reminded to live every day well and to just grab onto every day and there you are jason saying but that's exhausting and i hear what you're saying right there Karen. and i think that's that's an honesty that we don't hear enough about i mean mm -hmm. you're you're making me check my heart and my motives mm -hmm. for even coming here i mean it's my job to be here to listen sure. but to even listen to you now i'm thinking what else is god going to say through you all mm -hmm. and that's there's a whole conversation beyond this radio program it, it really is beautiful uh, what god's doing it's the here. power of peace i mean mm -hmm. it, what i'm catching in you is peace that the lord's yoke mm -hmm. is light yeah if mm -hmm. we truly are in him that's right and you have such a beautiful peace about where you're at i just wish uh, we could all bottle that up yeah. and yeah. uh drink it down ourselves mm -hmm. so we could live it that way too um let me ask you in regard to the journal that you've referenced Sure. You've mentioned it a couple times. I'd love to hear in your voice uh, an entry that would illustrate how you're communicating about your journey. All right. This is from the post, My Darkest Hours. And often when everybody's asleep, those are the hours I, I struggle to remember the truth. Mm. And um, I'm often gripped with how young my youngest is mm. and how I really... My greatest heart's desire is for her to have her own memories and not have to inherit them from her brothers and sisters. And um, each day feels like an answer to that prayer. So here's the post. Every moment given to me feels like a precious gift. In the daylight I live that gift. 
My children's faces are chapped from too many kisses. Their ribs are sore from fierce hugs. Somehow, I feel as though I'm trying to fill a cup so full with love that it will carry my children through a lifetime. But if I'm believing the truth and thinking on Jesus, I know my love is merely an extension of His great, abundant, reckless love. That love transcends me. That is a love that can truly carry my children through whatever they will face. In the night, I struggle to remember. In the night, I forget about the gain of heaven, and I merely long to stay and live Christ. The best thing about Jesus is that He knows. He asked for the cup to be passed from Him. He knows. He longs to hear my tears in the night, and every morning I wake to His new mercies and the sweet faces He has granted me to love. How do you struggle in the night to remember the truth of the gospel? Mm. That is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it transcends this life. Yeah. And uh, I so appreciate just your heart and the way that you share that. Do you ever ask yourself the why me question? You know, after I got my second diagnosis, actually, I think it was after I found out that it was in my brain. I turned to Jason and I said, anger feels easy, but sadness feels like the journey we're called to. And it felt like a choice. And so Jason and I have just been fighting to be sad instead of angry. And I feel like God has granted, been faithful to us in that. It's hard to be sad. It's, um, it's hard. But um, I don't want to be angry. Mm -hmm. Is that a choice you have to make every day? No. No. I feel like we had that moment. We were on the floor of the corner of our bedroom crying. And we looked at each other and said, yeah, let's go through sorrow instead of anger. And I feel like that we made that choice. And I mean, I, I, I would be lying if I didn't say there were moments of desperation and begging, Lord, let me stay, let me be here. But it's not angry, it's just begging. I'm just uh, a beggar. Jason, how about for you again, as the husband, the why question, why us? Do you ever grapple with that? You know, at some point in the beginning, I probably did a little more. I feel like as we've walked through this, and as I read the Bible, I see that God is sovereign over everything. And so in one sense, I think being asking that why me and being angry, I'm really confronted with God's sovereign. And I think just being reminded of that's who God is. And you read through the Bible and the Bible is full of people that suffer. And they're broken. And what does God do? He restores them. He gives them peace. He walks with them in the midst of that. So, you know, just as Kara said, I'd rather, I'd rather be able to be sad and broken and be continually reminded that God is the one who is sovereign. And my anger is not going to accomplish anything. And I think at the root between sadness and anger, you know, it's mostly softness. I think if you're angry, your heart tends to become more hard. Uh, where sadness, I just feel a little more broken. And I'm okay with that. Because I see in the midst of that brokenness that God meets me there. And I do have a lot of peace. And I think the other thing that I'm reassured in, and this is something you mentioned about if we really understood what heaven was like more, we'd have a different view of earth and our time here. And one of the phrases in the New Testament that sticks out with me is our union with Christ. And here's this amazing union with Christ that is unbreakable in death. 
And so our faith in Christ is he seals us as his children. Uh, as we die, it's unbreakable. It just becomes more and more real, which makes me think more about my present life in, am I really, really trusting in that? Uh, that is well said. Um, you you know, be a pastor. You should be a pastor. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, you know, it, again, it feels to me, even though we're talking about these deep, difficult situations that you're walking in, mm -hmm. it feels like holy ground. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? We could talk about tips on marriage and mm -hmm. you know, how to raise your kids. It's a different feel, isn't mm -hmm. it, John? It just feels like we're in the presence of the Lord here. There's something so profound about brokenness with him. It's as if the Holy Spirit is looking for that human heart that is broken mm -hmm. because he can do so much with it. Mm -hmm. yes. I love that scripture says he's close to the broken heart and saves those crushed in spirit. Yeah. Right. What does that mean? It means the pride is knocked out of you. That's yeah. Right. When you're walking at this level, mm -hmm. there's no more pride. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just, can I live another day? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Lord seems to respond to that. The woman with the issue of blood, um, she just wanted to touch his hem. Right. Mm -hmm. And maybe if I do that, I'll be healed. Mm -hmm. Do you wake up in the morning thinking about that? That if I somehow, if I could just reach out and touch the Lord in a certain way, he mm -hmm. would turn to me. Or do you feel he him has. turning to he you every has. day? I f you know, I mm -hmm. came to Christ late in life. I went from a life of anger and bitterness to just this amazing freedom in knowing Jesus and knowing grace. And, um, that was my healing. Wow. You know, May so you 4th, did, 1994 was You didn't need a day. miracle to no, know God that loves was it. you. That mm -hmm. was that That's moment. Powerful. That was that moment. And I feel in this cancer, he said, Kara, glorify me in it. And I'm biting too, but in not my own strength because that would just stink of fake and, and everybody would know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in his grace, he has given me a story. And two weeks ago, I led a high school friend to the Lord uh. who lost her husband after Thanksgiving a motorcycle accident. She wrote me, what is this piece you write on? Mm -hmm. And that's the healing. That's the healing. That's the redemption. And one day I will have actual healing and be in the presence of the Lord. Well, and again, if you think about that spiritual family tree, absolutely, your testimony leading at least one, and I'm sure many, many others, like my mother, sure. uh, to the Lord, to a point of repentance and acceptance. As you said, Jason, uh, it's a beautiful thing. And I think we're going to see that on the other side, I, that I this breath so. and this life was for one purpose, mm -hmm. to accept Jesus Christ as Lord yeah. so that you have eternal life. And that's the healing. <laughs> that's I, mean, I, I mean, sure, I would love to be healed of cancer. Mm -hmm. Sure, I would love to be here more days. But I have today. I have today. And our call is to be faithful today. And that's what Jason and I went through a hard season before we moved out here. And I remember getting into bed with him and going, are we going to be okay, Jason? Are we going to be okay? And he looked at me and said, Kara, we get to wake up tomorrow and be faithful. And that's how Jason lives. And I get to live next to him as my leader. And through this suffering, there have been those moments, are we gonna be okay, Jason? Mm -hmm. And he says, tomorrow we get to wake up and be mm -hmm. faithful. And it says in the Psalms, the nearness of God is our good. And we have come to believe and know and taste and feel that it is our only good. <sighs> that's it. Kara, we're talking right now to people, women, mm -hmm. who are in a, a desperate spot for whatever reason. You can fill in the description. Absolutely. It may be cancer. It may be something entirely different. But it's as if the enemy of their soul has them by the ankle and won't let go. And it's trying to pull them into that hole of desperation, mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, whatever it may be. What would you say to her? I would say the darkness that you're living in, the deep darkness, you need the light of Christ to shine on it. And we are such weak vessels 
that we need people to help us shine the light on it. And the power of community is that you need to find a safe place to share your ugly, your hard, your heartache. And you need first to go to the Lord and and just talk to him. He wants to hear our hearts. But we need brothers and sisters around us that are safe, that can help shine the light in the darkness we're living in. There are times I'm consumed by my own darkness. I'm, you know, some of the intensity I talked about, the heart of sin that can come into that is this over focus on yourself. Mm. And that doesn't please God. And so I need my sisters, I need Jason to remind me of God with me, Emmanuel. And I need to, I need to be to, able to say out loud the embarrassing things. The embar- we get our minds on a loop of lies mm-hmm. and we go to bed hearing them. Mm-hmm. I'm a failure. I was a terrible mom today. I, you know, any number, I over eight today. I, women, we have a, a loop that we play and we need to say it out loud and put the light of the gospel on it uh. um, to shine on the darkness or else it stays dark. And that darkness is a very lonely place. It is lonely. Jason is a husband. I mean, there are husbands that are seeing their wives struggle. What would you say for them? What do they need to do to be the steadfast helpmate of a husband in that situation? I think, um, at least in our situation, I would encourage them just to uh, take time with their wives and figure out how do you love your wife in the midst of that. I don't know if there's a... um, Your gift is really has been gentleness towards me. I think, I think you have walked and I think that's what most women want is just a gentle shepherding and, um, and you particularly towards me are so servant hearted. You know, he was asked for a year to be mom and dad in my absence. And he didn't begrudge that. It was hard, but um, you gave beyond your ability to give. Uh, well, that question I think is an interesting question. I, I don't really know how to answer that question. Mm. Um, I, I continually go back to the passage in Mark 1 of repent and believe. And I think sometimes we want to see people in suffering and then think about what their life was like and what what might have caused that so then we can program our life to not have any of those because we really we all want to escape suffering i do too i don't want anything to do with it i want a pleasant life but i think it's thinking through that passage in mark of repent and believe and if your wife is whatever she is struggling through or suffering in, how can you live a life of faith and repentance? How can you uh, love your wife? How can you see the things that you can fill? How can you point her to Christ? How can you be honest about your own sin and failure and repent of it and be partners and a team in the suffering? Because when your wife suffers, you as a husband, you suffer also. Um, and it doesn't look the same. And that's, I think, one of the blessings of suffering, uh, at least in a marriage, is you have someone else who can uh, walk through that with you. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully, who can point you to talking about what is true mm. and laying in bed at night. And when Kara says, all these things go through my head, and I can clearly tell her, And we can have a conversation of, no, you know, those are, those are all lies. Those are only creating fear in you. So let's talk about uh, the redemption story. Let's talk about what is really true and remind her of that. Jason, let me ask you this. It may be a bit bold, so I apologize, Um, but I think it has the potential to help people. Um, When in your situation, um, I'm sure you think about that time that might come Mm -hmm. where Kara's not with you and 
you're in a different spot that way because you've got your four kids and mm -hmm. do you let your mind wander into that or do you think about it do the two of you talk about it um, I mean that you may be in some ways given our faith in Christ you're in a in some ways a more difficult position oh I think he absolutely mm. is Jim I think he is watching someone you love suffer I think is a lot harder than actually suffering uh, I mean that it's hard to understand yeah. that, but I think there's merit to it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something, Karen, I've talked about. Um, I don't like to talk about it. Um, I can but see I it. think you're right. It is a, you know, it's a real, it's a real thing. In our age, it's not something that you usually talk about. And so I've gotten more used to smaller conversations about it and talking through you know how can i love our kids in that and communicate with them kara is very good about when i get impatient with our kids that we you know begin to have a conversation you want her wanting to see that transformed in me which is a good thing because i do need to be more patient with our kids so uh, yeah, it's not something I like to talk about. You're plagued with fear of the moment you have to tell the kids I'm gone. Yeah. That's that's the hardest part for him, that moment. It, we know Grace will be there. Yeah. We know it'll be there. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, my worst fear in this is coming, you know, when Carrot does die or be, having to communicate that to our kids. But then also, like coming home after a funeral. Mm. Huh. And how do you live life when the person you wanna process the hardest thing in your life with is not there? Yeah. So for me, that is my greatest fear and concern and as we talk about it it's helpful but then i also need to remember that uh, christ is enough yeah. and in that moment christ will be enough it is that going to be that tough balance between uh, instilling in your children the fact that christ is enough and he is real and mom is now with him yeah. There's almost this paradox of celebration, yeah. yet mourning, which is, again, so much the scripture, isn't it? Yeah. But I could tell you, I mean, that day, as a nine-year-old boy, mm. I can remember smells, I can remember colors, I can mm. remember everything about that day, even though it was so many decades ago. But when we yeah. got back from the funeral of my mom, that's when my stepdad stepped out and said, I'm leaving mm. and just walked out the door. Oh, so we didn't have that steady hand of a father mm -hmm. to say, I'm still here with you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Jim. And that'll be a huge difference for your kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Powerful for them to see the love of their dad for their mom and to have that memory. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. Yeah. I think I, the thing I've learned about future fears that we both have, mm -hmm. I have a huge fear of having a long end and having, not for me personally, but for the people I love having to watch it. Cancer can be a beast like that. But the thing, when you think in your future, like Jason is, or that I do, when you think in the future, God's daily grace isn't there. You only see yourself. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so we have to fight all that future thinking because I know that I know that I know on that day his grace is going to be very abundant. Uh -huh. And, you know, there was one day I w couldn't be at church because I had a surgery. And Jason looked and saw the kids on the pew without me and just wept because it can, those future fears can grab us and steal all of our peace. And I think that's the real enemy of our hearts. Huh. 
Um, so I think that's part of Jason doesn't want to talk about it. It hurts. Yeah. But I we, know that grace will be there. And, mm-hmm. and I'm feeling that those in my life right now, I'm, I'm praying those future prayers because my prayers will meet them. They yes. will be there. My prayers today have entered eternity. Right. And so mm-hmm. my prayers for godly husbands and, and a wife for my son, <clears throat> those are going to keep going yeah. forever. And, uh, it's, and those memories will be so strong. I mean, just hugging your kids. Mm-hmm. They'll remember that hug that day for the rest of their lives. It's tough. I think we're at a point where it'd just be appropriate to pray. Okay. And uh, maybe if you would allow me, I'll do that for you. I'd love to. And yeah. with you. If, Father, we come before you broken. Oh, Lord. This life can get so hard. And, uh, you know, for uh, Jason and Kara, they're in it right now, Lord. And we want to pray. That if it be your will, Lord, that uh, Kara's body would be healed. Mm-hmm. And of course we long for that, Lord. And they long for it more than any other. And Lord, yet I can sense in their spirit that they simply want your will to be done. Mm-hmm. And Father, uh, we realize that as well. That you see a bigger picture than we see. You see the impact and the good that can come from everything. As your word says in Romans 8, Mm -hmm. that all things, not some things, that all things work together for good. For those who love you and are called by your name. I sense, Lord, so deeply that this couple believes it. And Lord, I pray that um, as the days and weeks and months pass, Lord, that your peace and your hand and your blessing would be upon them and upon their children in such a way that each of their lives will count in such a meaningful way to steer people toward you. And that we've heard the testimony of one being saved because of Kara's story. I pray that many more will come to the Lord, that they will come to you, Lord, because of the testimony you've given them. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. It's been a privilege. Hmm. Well, what a time we've had. What an incredible time with Jason and Kara Tippetts on today's Focus on the Family. And they've reminded us that God does not promise an easy life, but he is faithful to be there with us, to walk through those difficulties, to give us strength in the moment. And if you're experiencing a hard season today, I'll encourage you to find a local pastor or counselor that you can talk with, that you can open up with, and um, I'll encourage you to not go this path alone. And you might want to get a copy of Kara's book, The Hardest Piece. It's available at local booksellers and online retailers. And when you're online, We have a variety of articles and downloads and resources to encourage you in your faith. Our program was provided by Focus on the Family. And on behalf of Jim Daly and the entire team, thanks for listening in. I'm John Fuller, inviting you back next time as we once again provide trusted insight and encouragement to help you and your family thrive.